Hope Church, you are beautiful. First service, didn't even know it, but they witnessed a miracle in their midst as I forgot my glasses. But now I have them, so be ready. Turn to someone next to you and say, God's got a miracle for you. And won't you take your seats as we jump in this morning. And I just want a quick word on your leaders. These are amazing people. And I want to tell you they love you deeply. And uh, their family have been prepared to pay many prices. I watch the journeys with Zambia and continue to watch their journey as they love and pour into the church. We find you as a church and your leaders incredibly inspiring. And it's just an incredible privilege to be together, to be here in this moment. I have children, but they aren't with us. Their names are Judah, Ben, and Daniel. I think we might have popped a picture up. And then my beautiful wife who's wearing the, the, the Hope Church red today. Look at that. Candace. But Hope Church, I want to tell you, you are a miracle. And God continues to do miracles in your midst. And sometimes we miss them. Sometimes we move on. And sometimes life happens too fast. But God wants to continue to do miracles. Our God is a miracle-working God. Honestly, when the church stops expecting miracles, we become boring. And church isn't supposed to be boring. And um, God continues, I want to inspire and I want to call us and encourage you in your journey of enjoying and pursuing Jesus as he's called us to at this time. I wanna preach out of 2 Kings chapter three to five. And um, chapters three to five, and the new, there's a new prophet on the block. He's the man now. It's like the, Jesus hasn't come, so the veil hasn't been torn, so God still speaks through his prophets and only through his prophets to his people. And Elisha's the guy. I mean, he's the main man. And he starts with just a boom, bang. He's got some miracle of water from Moab. And then he's got the miracle for the, the widow. And then he's got the miracle where the, the army are eating and the food is poison. And he says, actually, he did again. And, and God does a miracle in that water. And then there's the command in the army, Naaman. And, and he's got leprosy. And no one can touch it. No one can fix it. And basically, he should be outcast. And God does a miracle doesn't just take away the leprosy. He makes his skin like the skin of a young child. He, he gets renewed. And I want to tell you, God wants to continue to reveal his glory. You know why? Not so that church is entertaining, so that God gets his glory. I want to tell you, worship a God who is jealous for his glory. He's jealous for it. And he wants to do it in your midst. He wants to do it for his glory. And I want to speak this morning, just in the middle of 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a story about a widow. And this widow has by definition, experience lost. She's lost her husband, who was a God-fearing, God-honoring man who'd worked in the presence of God's people. And then she's lost financial security. She's losing dreams and hopes. And she's sitting on the precipice of potentially losing her children. I mean, who knows? You can take my car, you can take my house, but don't come near my kids. Don't come for my kids. And in the reality of her day and age, when you get in financial debt, one way and a standard practice in that time was your children would be taken in as slaves by the person you owed money to. A tragedy, but a reality of their time. In the last two years, everyone's experienced loss. Maybe for you, your loss was less. It was, you were locked away at home for a couple of weeks. You, you, maybe you've lost jobs. Maybe you've lost opportunity. Maybe you've lost dreams. Maybe you've lost possibilities. I'm not sure. I know that every Sunday I preach, there's a lady in our auditorium who sits there, and in June of 2020, she lost her husband and her son to a COVID. I know that there are people who have lost savings who've lost the ability to see grandkids, who've lost out. I know there are young people who are saying, my dreams, my desires to experience life got clamped down. Well, God wants to speak into your loss and reveal himself. He wants to do a miracle in your story. We're gonna look at this amazing lady in 2 Kings 4. It says this, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? I love that question. It's like, surely you know how you can help me. He just says, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour out, pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. 
But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said to her, go, sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. I pray, Spirit of God, as you are here this morning, your word says that where the word is preached, we'll see signs and wonders. I pray for signs and wonders this morning in hearts to be moved to see you, in lives transformed, and in those in deficit and death this morning encountering the living God. Get all the glory, King, we pray. Amen. So this morning, it's simply called the perfect pour. The perfect pour. As she begins to pour out her little bit of oil, miracles start to happen, and those jars get to fill up. And I want to speak this morning because it starts out like this. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets, she is a faithful lady whose man had served God faithfully. Now she's crying out because they're in debt. And people often ask the questions, why do good things happen to, why do bad things happen to good people? You've heard that. That's the ongoing question. Well, she learns in the midst of her chaos, she cries out to Elisha, who in those days, there was, uh, there was, the veil was still in place, so she couldn't approach God. Now we get to approach God directly. She cries out. And my point, number one, is simply this, pour out your cries to God. We've become too subdued, church. We've become too subdued in our calling of God. We've become too subdued in our pursuit of God and our expectations of God. I don't think God's saying, stop asking me for stuff. I'm busy. I think he's going, where's my church? Where are my people? Again, this story is about a woman and her children about to go into slavery. In July last year, we had been through months of chaos that hit us like a tank driving into our house as one of our sons encountered a mental health break. And without too many details, it resulted in the end of much therapy and much time and much trying to help him. I ended up going to a psychiatric hospital with my son for weeks, three weeks. And as I sat every morning and my son would go off to his sessions at eight o'clock and meet with psychiatrists, psychologists, and all these specialists, neuroscience psychologists, I didn't know what to do. I'm a pastor. I preach the gospel. But all I know how to do is worship God. All I know to do is to cry out to him. So I would work, walk my way up, and it's this clinic where you'd walk up to the top of the mountain and had a view and had a chair there at the top, a little bench. And every day, I'd sit and I'd cry out to the living God. Because I believe God has given us gifts of medicine. I believe those things. But I know that there's a God in heaven who's a healer. And I know that he wants me to pour out my cries. And I want to tell you, they were embarrassing, tearful, ugly cries. They weren't like the good kind you can put in a selfie. They were like, God, where are you? I need you now. Because I want to tell you, you're only strong as your weakest child. Especially when we start them. And this lady realizes that she's in emotional poverty. She's in financial poverty. And she starts to cry out. She pours out. Says, Elisha, you want to see a miracle? Well, let me take you back to this amazing lady. And the prophet says to her, what do you have? And her automatic answer is this world and most of our automatic answer. I've got nothing. God says, pour out on your poverty. She realizes, no, but I actually don't have nothing. I have a little bit of oil. Just a little bit. I want to tell you, maybe your answer this morning is, I've got nothing. Well, if you've encountered Jesus, the Bible says you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is always described as the oil, and I promise you've got oil. Will you pour it out? But will you pour out in your poverty? You see, everyone's waiting for the day when Paul gets up and encourages people to give. Why? Because it's good for you to give. It's good for your soul. It's good for your heart. But we always say, well, when day, one day when I've sorted that and I've paid that off and I've fixed that, God says, no, I'm calling you in your worship, in your praise, and out of your poverty, I want to teach you that I'm the God of abundance and miracles. He pulls us, and I'm telling you, all too often when we've been in deficit for too long, it becomes our whole narrative, our whole story. It's the only story we can tell. We tell our story of loss. God wants to change your story but he needs you to pour out in your poverty. So will you pour out your cries? Will you pour out in your poverty? And, sit, and thirdly, Elisha says, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. When I read that, this is the point I got. Will you pour out in humility? Will you pour out humility? What do I mean? Well, 
Everyone knows her husband's passed away and he was a God-fearing man. Where's her God now? Everyone knows that she's at risk of her kids going to slavery. Everyone knows. And God says to her, I want you to go to all your neighbors and ask them for empty jars. First problem, go to my neighbors. Are you mad? I've got to humble myself to a point. I've got to go to my neighbor and say, can I have your jars? And they're going to go, why? Well, because we got nothing. Cool. Why are you asking for empty jars? Well, because Elisha said, we've got to ask for empty jars. And I want to be obedient to the commands of God in my life. So I've got to ask for empty jars. Why? Because we know that when there was an earth, there was nothing. God spoke into that which was formless and empty. And he breathed his life and he spoke. And God is looking for empty vessels. He doesn't need my will. I've got, I put in my effort. I'm th three quarters of the way there. Can you just top me up? So she humbles herself and goes to her neighbors and says, can I have your empty jars? And they go, sure, here's one. They go, no, actually, I need all of them. Will you pour out humility? Fourthly, and this is probably the most profound of all. Verse four, then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars as each one is filled. Put it to one side. She left them, shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. Well, she kept pouring. She took a little bit of oil. But here's the amazing thing. You see, Lee, we live in a world of, here, look at me doing my nice deed for someone who's not as good as me. Here, look at me doing this. And it's all on some social media program and we get likes. But the Bible says the miracle happens when she goes behind closed doors. And she starts to pour. She starts to pour her little bit. And she's got her little bit of oil and she's pouring. She's pouring, oh, this is her last. This is all she's got. And God's saying, will you pour out your last? Will you pour out all you got? She just begins to pour. And you know what? She starts to see the jars full up. And she's going, but, but this is a miracle. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. And she pours. This is a miracle. Bring the next one. This is a miracle. And they pour until there's not a jar left. The problem is, that happens behind closed doors where there's only one who can watch. What are you pouring out in the private? What are you pouring out? We can worship on Sundays, but if we aren't worshiping in the presence of God, we can come to the Word on Sundays, but if we aren't coming to the Word of God every other day, we can be in His presence and enjoy communion on Sunday, but if it's like only on Sunday, that's my time. I'm telling you, you aren't pouring, you are trickling, and you are limiting, and you are making smaller what God wants to do in your story, he's calling you to partner. You say, well, Mark, what you're talking about is partnering in my miracles. No, God does everything. Yes, God does everything, but he calls us to partner. Why? Because he's looking for a people who will trust him. The whole of the book of Exodus, just about one thing. I need you to learn to trust me as I take you from slavery. I need those slavery ways out of you, and I need to know that I love you. Cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. What are you pouring out when no one is watching you. And then it says this, when all the jars were full, say full. full, full, full. When last did you feel full? Seriously. We live in a world of never enough. Not just a song from the greatest showman, a reality of most people's hearts. It's I've never got enough. My wife never loves me enough. My kids don't respect me enough. I don't have enough money in the bank account. My boss isn't paying me enough. The government's not giving me enough. I've never got enough. Full. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. Imagine the excitement, the three of them, her two sons are like, take your kids on a journey of faith. Take them. And as my child, who's now doing well and, and made much stride, we went on, a, we had, were forced to take three months off and we went on a long trip and we would travel for hours and we would pray and cry out to God, take your kids as his little brothers would place their hands upon him and declare the promises of God over his life, reminding him of who he is amidst his chaos. Take your family with you behind the closed doors where no one can see. He says, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. If it had stopped there, it would have been spectacular because here's the point. God pours out to perfection. Go and pay your debts. She came with an expectation, a need, and a desire for her kids not to go in slavery. That was her dream. That's her desire. That was the limit of her expectation. That's all she had faith and courage to ask for. Done. Done. Complete. So they got this many jars. God says, filled up each of them to full. How good is God? 
Well, let me tell you, because it doesn't stop there. It carries on and says, you and your sons can live on what is left. Her husband is gone and Jesus steps in, God steps in, the father steps in, your husband's gone, but I will be your provider. And when man thinks man can take your children from you, I will show you that I will not just step in the gap, I will make a greater way into more and abundance in your life. I love it. I, the first miracle Jesus does in the book of John is a miracle of abundance. As this couple get married and they run out of wine, it's the most embarrassing thing that can happen in the Western Cape and at that time at a wedding. Let's be honest. We're not talking tussies here. We're talking the good stuff. And it says the best wine, the best wine. But here's the insight. In those days, families wouldn't give them gifts and, and no gifts to at home. They would, get, uh, they would get to keep everything that was left over from the feast and sell it. And the community would buy it. And that would be their nest egg for their future. God says to this couple, I want to tell you when the world runs out on you, I will step in and I will turn water to wine. And I will pour it in such abundance and quality that I will astound you with a precedent to the generations to come. Then I am the God of abundance in your life. I don't know where you're sitting right now watching online. God is a God of abundance. He's calling you to more. He's speaking out today. But I want to land in the minutes that we have left and tell you about Jesus. Because I love the faith of this widow. I love the God story. And I love the miracles of Elisha. But none of them are the heroes today. Now Ephesians says this, because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured can you say that with me? Poured. No, you've got to say it with some passion. Poured. His blood poured on the altar of the cross. I don't know what your cross, the cross looks like in your mind, but it wasn't neat. It wasn't some little controlled experiment. It was blood pouring, pouring on the cross. We are free people, free of penalties and punishment, chalked up by all our misdeeds, and not just barely free either. We are abundantly free. As they stuck that spear in his side, my Savior's side, my King's side, my lover's side, they stuck a spear in his side. It said the blood and the water poured. It poured. It poured. Maybe you're struggling to believe in a God who pours out abundance upon your life. Maybe your circumstances and the losses of the years that have passed have pulled you into a space of believing, well, I'm just out of slavery from Pharaoh's grip, but I'm still in a desert. I want to tell you not. I want to tell you that's a lie. I want to tell you that if you've had the grace of God touch your life, there is blood that has paid away and it is poured over your story. Poured. You say, Mark, you don't know my pain. I don't know your pain, but I want to tell you about the blood that poured. I don't know your brokenness, but I want to tell you about the blood that poured. Mark, you don't know the debt that right now the debt is, and I'm scared to go home because the debt collectors will probably be there. Let me tell you about the blood that poured. Poured. And Jesus came. He said, your debt's nailed to the cross. Nailed to the cross. Your debt emotionally. The pain, what that person said to you 10 years ago. Your debt financially. Your debt of sin and your search histories that no one knows about and you've become so good at hiding. Nailed to that cross upon which the blood of Jesus Christ poured so that today you can stand free. Today you can stand spotless. Today you can walk with your shoulders back and your confidence in his promises upon your life. Today, not tomorrow, today. This is the gospel we preach. This is the promise of his word, a God who pours to completion and a God who pours in abundance. A God who says, I will pour out my spirit upon all men. A God who says, I, will, I have poured out my love. Don't leave without your miracle. God is a God who pours. As we sing this song, may his favor be upon you. I sing it with such confidence. I lead church in a, the campus where I'm based is in a tough part of town. Just chatting now with Paul Lamarinette, 65 to 70% of homes are single parent homes. Our youth is filled up of kids coming from broken situations, navigating things I wish they never had to and things I didn't have to. In the natural, I go, God, it's too much. But then I'm reminded of the cross with every one of their stories nailed to the cross. I'm reminded that his blood never fails. I'm reminded that he pulls us into a story, but he's calling you today, believer. 
Let me speak to you. If you're a believer today and you said, I made a decision to Jesus, will you pour out your cries to him? Will you stop being so small in your expectations of him? Oh, tick Sunday. Tick, read my Bible this morning. No, pour out your cries. Will you pour out of your poverty, your, your time, your talents, your treasures? Will you pour and say, well, I've got no more to give. You see, there were Sundays last year that I knew I had to go and preach a couple times the promises of God to a people of God while I sat in a study weeping from very early hours on a Sunday morning, but knowing a God, knowing a God, knowing a God who does not fail. And I, he's got the same for you. Believers, will you pour out of your poverty? Will you pour out of your pain? Will you pour out in humility? Oh, maybe it's just as simple as this. Will you come to one of the leaders in this church and say, I'm really struggling. You know how many people come to me and say, we came to your church two years ago because our marriage was in trouble, but we just sat here. And I'm going, why didn't you tell us? I did life saving in Durban for a number of years as a, as a volunteer back in the day. I know some of you well, this guy can't swim. Don't worry, I'm not coming for you now. <laughs> but as those beautiful volleys would come down, and some of you moved to Georgia as well, they would come down to North Beach. And as the life saver would sit here and go, here's a good one. They'd go out because they saw the surfers go out with the rip. They think, we can do that too. They jump into the rip and they start going on their boogie boards with their feet flopping on the roof with no fins and think, here comes the thing. And then all of a sudden they'd realize they're in trouble. You know what they would not do? Ask for help. Then they would chuck the board away. The one thing that could save them, the one thing that could keep them floating, they'd chuck it away. You know what they wouldn't do? Cry out for help. So we'd slowly walk down the pier knowing what's coming seen this before. And you know what is the last thing people do before they start swallowing water and drowning? Help me! It's the same in the church. It's the same right now. Some of you are drowning. You are barely above the water. You're about to take a big gulp of water that will kill you. And the only thing, if you will humble yourself before God, is cry out to God and cry out in the midst of his people who are worshiping. Say, will you cry out, help me, help me. And I had a WhatsApp group with three of our dear, dearest friends who had times when things were tough at home. And again, I'm telling you, we're much better now, but they were tough as a little boy who was so fearful, displayed anger to levels. I didn't understand. I would just send a message. And just say, please pray. We need help. Please pray. One or two of them in our church, I'm saying, please pray. We need help. Will you call on him now? Will you? Because here's a widow who had nothing. She's going to lose her kids. She just cried out. I don't know about you, but when it comes to my kids, I'll cry out. I'm not too proud to cry out. I'm not too proud to stand here and say, I had no answers last year except that Jesus is on his throne. And the only answer I have for you right now in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your brokenness, and you're sitting next to your spouse and you go, if anyone knew what was actually going on here, now will you cry out to God? Can you stand with me this morning? we close our eyes just for a second if that's okay believers Jesus loves you believers Jesus died every person in this room I want to tell you he died for you he poured out his blood for you so that your deficits your debts your darkness your disillusionment wouldn't pull you down to a grave so that you can live but will you cry out to him now Will you cry out to him? If you need to cry out to God, say, God, I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Will you lift your hands right now? And I want to pray for the drowning. Maybe you've been saved for 30 years. Maybe you've been saved for 40 years. Maybe, maybe saying, I, I'm a leader in this church. If I put my hand up now, it'll be embarrassing. Who would see? Lies, lies, lies. Cry out. Cry out to him now. Start right now. Open your mouth and pray. Say, my father who art in heaven, our Father, who art in heaven, I trust you. 
Will you say that with me? Let's say it together. Whether your hands are raised or not, will you say it with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, we trust you. If your hand's not raised, I want you to shout it over the people this morning. Say this, our Father, who art in heaven, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you with our debt. We trust you with our darkness. We trust you with our brokenness. We trust you this morning, God. And now before I move on, I want to pray. If you are here this morning, you're saying, Mark, I've never placed my trust in Jesus. And my lies, my debt, my darkness is not nailed to that cross. Do you think you could do it for me? I want to tell you the answer is simple. Yes. Yes. He wants to do it now. His eyes are closed in this morning and before I hand over to this band for us to declare his praise and pour out praise this morning. I want to ask you, if you haven't made a decision to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, today things change. Today darkness comes into the light. Today what was dead is alive. You're saying I need to make that decision. We lift your hand so I can see you and I'll pray with you this morning. Today your life changed. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Today. What was stained and broken is free and perfect in his eyes. Today, the blood of Jesus pours over you from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes. Not a square inch of your soul, your story, your life, your body. Where man has abused, God comes and he brings life and he renews because he is the God of heaven. He is the creator. He says, I speak into empty, broken vessels. Come alive. Come alive. Come alive. Come alive. Can we pour out our praise as God is moving in this house? Thank you so much for watching our YouTube channel. We really pray that it, you find it helpful in your journey. And we also really want to encourage you to take your next step by signing up to join a small group or to do discovery. Thanks again for watching and don't forget to subscribe and share this with as many people as possible. And we really can't wait to see you next Sunday.